Right, so speed. Was that a scalar quantity or a vector quantity? Yeah, it is scalar. Right, so does that mean it has a direction? Does it have a direction if it's scalar? No, it's described by a magnitude alone, right? Just by a number. Um, now, speed refers to, you have a very inter intuitive idea of speed. Uh, it refers to how fast an object is moving. Right? It refers to how fast an object is moving. How fast an object is moving, um, aka, uh, actually I probably should write IE, but that's fine, uh, aka the rate at which an object covers distance. So this is the rate at which an object covers distance. Now, we're not going to be using a lot of formulas uh, for this first little bit in physics. However, it is important that you do know the formula. Uh, so when we're talking about speed, if we ever want to find our speed that we were going over some period of time, uh, we can find our average speed. by taking our distance covered, right, our distance and we can divide this by the time it took to cover that distance. Right, so we can take our distance and we can divide that by the time it took to cover that distance. Yeah. Can someone help him out? He needs a piece of paper. Thank you. Alright, so that is the formula for speed. Um, I will be representing this most commonly as V is equal to D over T. I know it's weird to see V there, but it'll make sense in a second. I mean, I could write S. It doesn't really matter. What variable we use. Um, but I want you to get in the habit of using this little hat and you'll see what I mean in a second. Alright, so for example, let's say I was walking and I covered, I don't know, let's say six meters in three seconds. What would be my average speed if I covered six meters in three seconds? Yeah? two meters per second. Uh, we'll do some example problems in a bit that kind of look at this and explore it, but it would be two meters per second. Uh, let's talk about velocity now. So velocity, is that a scalar or a vector? It is a vector. Okay, this is a vector. And instead of referring to how fast that object is going, um, it refers to Uh, the rate at which, this is my shorthand for which, an object changes its position. The rate at which an object changes its position. What is a change in position called? What is a change in position called? We learned the word last class. Yeah, displacement. So this is a, AKA the rate the rate at which its displacement changes.
And although these things kind of seem like the same thing, keep in mind, displacement sometimes can be rather intuit unintuitive, right? Um, I showed you several examples yesterday where the person was moving the entire time, yet their displacement was zero, right? So it's possible for you to have a speed of, say, 30 kilometers an hour, yet still have a velocity of zero. If your displacement is zero, your velocity will also be zero, right? All right, so what is the formula for velocity? It is going to be the same as this formula, effectively. Um, actually, let's, let's write it out. Uh, you know what, Let, let's actually do the formula in a little bit. I want to talk about instantaneous versus average velocity first. Um, but for our direction of our velocity, it's pretty easy to determine. How do we determine the direction of our velocity? It's very intuitive. Just look at the bar. Look where you end up. Which, yeah, from start to finish, where you end up, right? So the direction of your displacement, right? Whatever the direction of your displacement is, um, that will be the direction of your velocity. So the, the direction of your displacement, right? The direction of your change in position, um, that will be the direction of your velocity. So if I had a displacement of 100 meters east, my velocity would be something to the east. Okay, so the direction of your displacement is going to be the direction of your velocity. Now, since a moving object will often change its speed as you are driving, we need to kind of find out some ways that we can determine uh, that average speed. And we have to distinguish that from instantaneous speed. Actually, I changed my mind. Let's write down the formula for velocity right now. I changed uh, The formula for velocity is going to be, so your velocity will be equal to your uh, change in your position, right? Actually, we'll write this out with words first. Change in position. And what is another word for your change in position? Your displacement. Um, over the change in time. So how long it took for that change in position to occur. Another way of writing this, we wanted to just represent it symbolically. We would say our velocity is equal to our change in our position over our change in time. Now, that's what that little Greek symbol delta means. So if you ever see delta, right, delta is going to be change in for physics, OK? So that represents a change in our position over a change in our time. And remember, a change in our position is displacement. So a change in position is displacement. Yep? Ah, good question. So this little hat I'm drawing here, this little arrow, that represents that it is a vector quantity and thus it has a direction, right? That's why speed doesn't have that little hat on it, whereas velocity does, right? Velocity has a direction, our displacement has a direction. Now, whenever we represent the change in something, the change in something can be represented by well, how did I describe displacement? It only cares about what? Start to finish. So if we want to find the change in our position, let's say we had a number line, right? Here's our number line. 
uh, this is the zero point. Let's say you went from, um, I don't know, let's say you went from like negative two to positive six. That was your journey. You went from negative two to positive six. What was your total displacement here? Positive eight, right? Positive eight. Um, now, how did you figure that out? You just solved it intuitively, right? But mathematically, how does that work? Well, if you ever want to find the change in something, you will say, okay, well, what was the change in our position here? Well, that is going to be our final position minus our initial position, right? That's going to be our final time minus our initial time. Oftentimes, we don't have to think about time in this way, though. What was our final position? It was six, right? Six meters minus negative two meters. So our total displacement was eight meters. And this idea of the change in something, that's going to come up quite a bit. Okay, so this whole final minus initial, uh, that's going to come up a lot in all of our work. Okay. So now let's explore very briefly the difference between instantaneous speed and average speed. So the equation I gave you was average speed, right? Average speed is your total distance covered over your total time. Instantaneous speed is something different. Right? What's something in your car that tells you how fast you are going in that instant? Speedometer. Yeah, your speedometer, right? Um, yeah, no, let's take a note on that. Why not? So we do need to distinguish between average speed and instantaneous speed because on your drive to school today, for example, were you going the same speed the entire time? No, of course not, right? Your instantaneous speed was all over the map. But how would you calculate your average speed for that journey? If you wanted to know the average speed you were traveling, how would you do it? Yeah? Um, like the time it took you, or the, how far you were divided by time, or if you were time. Yeah, you're right. By no, no, you're right, you're right. So it's, it'd be the distance to school divided by how long it took you to get here. That would give you your average speed. But it wouldn't tell you anything about your speed variations within your journey. So let's write that down because oftentimes students will treat these as the same thing, but they are not. So instantaneous speed um, this is going to be the speed at a given instance of time. And you said it, Cooper. What instrument in your vehicle tells you this? Speedometer. Yeah, you're right. It's a speedometer, right? So uh, this is what your speedometer says, right? What your speedometer says. What your speedometer says. Now, your average speed is different. Your average speed does not take into consideration all of those fluctuations in instantaneous speed. It averages them out. So this is going to be the average of all instantaneous oh well I spelled that wrong <laughs> instantaneous so it's going to be the average of all instantaneous speeds the average of all instantaneous speeds and how did we find this again? How did we find this out? We're going to take what? 
Yeah, your total distance divided by total time. All right, so this is found simply. by your total distance over total time. Right, how long it took. So that is the important distinction between uh, instantaneous speed and average speed. OK, so now that we got the, the theory out of the way here, let's do a couple practice problems. Let's do a couple practice problems. We're going to start pretty simple again. Let's, uh, let's look at a couple paths. Let's look at a couple paths again. So let's say we have paths A, B, and C yet again. Path A, let's draw like this. Path B, yeah, let's draw path B like that. And let's say path C, we're going to make this uh, pretty extreme here. How do we want to do this? Right, there's path C. So these are three paths that were walked to school. Um, this individual is clearly a little drunk here. Uh, 10 steps to the left, 10 steps to the right. Um, but if we look at these three paths, let's compare now their average speed versus their velocity. Okay, so we're looking here at average speed versus velocity. Now, what is our formula for average speed again? Distance. Divide by time. So what do we need to know in addition to their distance? Because here I'm just showing you the paths they took. So what do we need to know in addition to their distance? How long it took. So I'm going to say that um, all three uh, paths took, let's say, 10 minutes. Uh, the time here doesn't actually matter. Uh, 10 minutes to complete. The time is completely irrelevant. Other than the fact that they all took the same amount of time. So I want you now to rank these from the slowest speed, I'm uh, sorry, the fastest speed to the slowest speed. Which one of these individuals would have been traveling the fastest? Oh, I got some conflicting answers. What do you think, Cooper? B? Why do you think it's B? So you said traveling over fast. It's Correct. So it's in C. Yes, it is in fact C. Why is it C? Carissa? Because if you like stretched it out, it yeah. would be a lot longer than the rest of them. Um, even though it was the shortest original distance, it's a lot it's a lot longer than the rest. So if you did it in ten minutes. Ah, that's the key, right? No, you're right. That's, that's a great answer. Um, so if you look, if we stretch this out, it would be the longest path, right? We covered the longest distance here. And again, remember, our, um, our average speed is our distance over our time. Well, if all of these paths took the same amount of time, Clearly, the one in which the distance covered was the largest is going to be the one you were traveling the fastest. Right? Think about it this way. If you had a 400 meter race and an 800 meter race and a 1200 meter race, and each of those races were completed in the same amount of time, well, which one of those races would you have to have been running the fastest? Well, obviously the 1200 meter race. If you're able to complete a 1200 meter race in the same amount of time as a 400 meter race, Clearly, you are going three times as fast for that 1,200 meters, right? So 
your time here, since it was the same for all three, the greatest distance uh, means the fastest speed. Uh, as a result, then, what is our second fastest speed? A. Yeah, it is, in fact, A, which means that B was our slowest. B was our slowest, right? B, the path taken, was the smallest distance, and since it took the same amount of time, they must have been going the slowest. On the other hand, if I was to rank from fastest to slowest our velocity, remember, velocity is our change in our position, over our change in time, what would be my fastest velocity of these three? What would be my fastest velocity? C. Which one? C. Or C. Sorry, uh, B. B. Does everyone agree? Do you think it's B? <laughs> I see the gears turning. Um, it is B. Why is it B? Remember, what is our change in position? That is our displacement. And displacement only cares about where you start and where you finish. It doesn't care about the path you take. So if we ignore the paths and we look, where did we start and where did we finish? Right? Where did we start and where did we finish? Well, it's pretty clear to see that in 10 minutes, the greatest displacement was B. Right? We started and stopped in the same, sorry, in the, uh, oh, excuse me. We started and stopped um, over the greatest change in position. Uh, so B was the greatest of our velocities. What was the second greatest velocity, the second fastest velocity? Which one? A. A. And then lastly, C. was C, right? So again, velocity can be really unintuitive. Our, we have a very strong intuition for speed. We have a very strong intuition for distance. But displacement can be weird, right? All it cares about is where you start, where you finish. It doesn't care about that path you take. Uh, let's look at another example quickly. Let's say uh, let's say let's give it the example of going to school and back. So Kenny, how far do you live from school, approximately? I don't know. You don't know? No. Okay, well, I'm going to make it up then. You, you live 4.3 four kilom kilometers away from school. All right, so Kenny, long walk to school in the morning, 4.3 kilometers. That's quite the walk. Um, now, walks to school in the morning. So here's a good old Fort Richmond Collegiate. And then at the end of the day decides to, well, let, let's go home. Let's walk home. Now, let's say that uh, Kenny was feeling rather, rather spry in the morning, decided to do this 4.3 kilometer walk. That was the first time you've ever heard that word before? No. Spry? No? Okay. Uh, you're feeling rather energetic, and you did this 4.3 kilometer walk in the morning, let's say in 30 minutes. Okay, so your, your walk to school took about 30 minutes. At the end of the day, you know, it's a little nicer out. It's not as blisteringly cold. We'll say that your walk home took, I don't know, let's say an hour. Why not? Took so you one hour, so twice as long. Now, based on this information, what was Kenny's average speed? So what was the average speed um, during this journey. What is our average speed again? Distance divided by time. 
right? Our total distance over our total time. So what was our total distance? Right? So there and back, that is 8.6 kilometers. And what was our total time? One hour and 30 minutes. And this is where I want to bring up something when it comes to, uh, well, just math in general. Can you just say, okay, let's divide by um, 1.3 hours? Does that work? Why not? Why would that be wrong? Because it's not an hour and a half, it's an hour and It's not even. Yeah, excellent. So you can't just add these numbers together and say, you know, 130 minutes or 1.3 hours because they're fundamentally different units, right? If there was, you know, 100 minutes in an hour, you could do that, but there's not. How many minutes are there in an hour? There's 60 minutes in an hour. So you're right, Chris. You could change it to minutes. You could say, okay, well, you know, one hour, um, there is, you know, is equal to 60 minutes, and then you could say, okay, well, 60 plus 30 is 90. Or you could say, okay, well, we have 30 minutes. Now, how many minutes are there in an hour? 60. There's 60. And you will get used to this style of conversion by the end of this unit, but in one hour, there are 60 minutes, right? In one hour, there are 60 minutes. So minutes here will cancel out because we're dividing, and we're left with hours. So what's 30 divided by 60? 0 0.5. So 30 minutes is 0 0.5 hours. So I could divide this by 1.5 hours, or I could divide this by 90 minutes. You just got to make sure that your units reflect that. So um, let's say we're going to divide this by, uh, let's say 1.5 hours. When I look outside and I look at speed limit signs, and sorry, if this is confusing to you, we're going to be doing so much conversion in this, in this unit that you'll get used to this eventually. Um, when we look at speed limit signs, how is the speed given to you? Kilometers per hour. That's why I'm choosing hours here, by the way. We have a very intuitive idea of speed if we talk about kilometers per hour. But do you really know how fast you're going if you're going in kilometers per minute? Do you have that intuitive sense? Not really, no. What's that? Just times well, yeah, just exactly, just times by 60. But just looking at the number, we're not used to seeing that. Can someone do this in their calculator for me, please, and thank you? Yeah, I got it. Uh, 5.733. 5.733. Right? Uh, kilometers per hour. Right? 30 minutes is half of an hour. And by the way, we kind of have this baked into our language. Right? If, I, if I said that it was uh, 9.15 right now, what's another way to describe that time? It's quarter past 9. Right? Because 15 minutes is a quarter of an hour. Right? What if I said it was 9.45? You could say it's quarter to 10, a.k.a. it's 9 and 3 quarters of an hour, right? So it is baked into the language we use, so don't stress too much about this right now. What's that? You were walking real fast. Yeah, this is pretty quick, actually, yeah. Especially this 4.3 kilometers in 30 minutes. Uh, that, that's a jog, that is not a walk. I forgot to do something on that last problem. I just realized. So we calculated the average speed, but what did we not calculate? Yeah, we didn't do the velocity. Now the velocity, luckily, is pretty easy to calculate here. 
What is our velocity going to be? Zero. Excellent. Why is our velocity zero? We're going back to the same place we started. We're going back to the same place we started. Right? So what is our total change in position here? Yeah, it doesn't matter that we were traveling for an hour and a half. Our displacement was zero, right? Therefore, our velocity is zero. And our velocity is zero. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to test your math skills this morning. Now, the math in this unit isn't too hard, to be honest. But we are going to be doing a lot of single step solve for x. So if that's something that you find challenging, you definitely need to practice that skill. Because uh, a lot of what we do is going to be single step solve for x. So I'm actually going to scrap that example, Brandon, to Winnipeg. Let's now talk about flying somewhere. Because uh, that's something we're not able to do right now. So let's say I wanted to go to uh, Mexico. I wanted to escape this snow right now. Okay, so I want to go to Mexico. Um, now, let's say I fly. Mm, I won't word this. All right, so I'm flying south. So I fly to Mexico for my vacation. So flying to uh, Mexico. From Winnipeg took, let's say, I don't know, six hours. Took six hours. Um, let's make this hard. So flying to, from, uh, flying to Mexico from Winnipeg took six hours, and the plane was traveling at a velocity of, let's say, Five hundred kilometers per hour south. We're gonna say that my destination was directly south of us. Directly south of us. Now let's say that okay, I'm tired of Mexico now. I have this the sun, the heat, it's overrated. I'm pretty pale. I got this crazy sunburn. Um, let's go to. I don't know, I changed my mind. I want to go to Texas instead. I don't know why I want to go to Texas, but let's just go to Texas. So, we then fly to Texas at a velocity of, say, you know, there was a bit of a, a headwind pushing us, so we were only going 400 kilometers per hour north. So if the flight to Texas took two hours. What was the distance traveled? And also, what was the displacement? Now, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do this question. Oh. All right. So let, let's figure this out. So whenever I um, do a problem like this, I like to draw a diagram. 
right? So that way I can kind of keep my thoughts organized and we're going to be doing a lot of that in this unit. Um, and by the way, we're only doing one dimensional effectively physics, right? So like, we're, we're not going to be looking at an X and a Y at the same time, right? So we are just looking straight north to south here. And we started in Winnipeg. And then we traveled all the way down to Mexico. And we traveled all the way down to Mexico. Um, and then we went back north again to Texas. Even if you were horrible at geography, I really hope you all realize that, but even if you were horrible at geography, you can kind of still figure this out um, because what was the direction of our velocity here? South, what was the direction of our velocity here? North, right? So clearly we traveled back up towards Winnipeg in this example here towards Texas. So even if your geography knowledge is horrific, you should still be able to plot something that looks something like this. All right, so from Winnipeg to Mexico, how can I figure out um, the distance traveled? Because, uh, yes, Kristen? Um, uh, it took six hours, and then it was, we traveled at 500 Excellent. Because if we are traveling in a straight line, will our distance and our displacement be the same? Yes. Right? In a straight line, they will be the same. So here, I can say, okay, well, if my, um, my velocity uh, was that 500 kilometers per hour south, uh, and so the formula for velocity is my change in position over my change in time. So if I wanted to figure out my velocity, well, how can I isolate that variable? How can I get our change in position on this side of the equation by itself? It's just solving for x, right? How do I do that? Yeah, remember, whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. That's really the only rule when solving for x. Now, then you have to use your intuition. Well, if we're dividing by time, we must do the reverse operation. We're going to multiply both sides by time, right? And this will then give us, well, our change in position is equal to our velocity times our change in our time. Exactly like you said, Chris, right? So our velocity here is 500 kilometers per hour, and this was south. And we are going to multiply this by six hours. Now, whenever you are doing problems like this, I recommend you do something called dimensional analysis. We always will check to make sure we're left with the units we want. We have hours here divided by hours. They cancel out. And we are left with kilometers. Is kilometers a unit of distance, a unit of displacement? It is. So what is 6 times 5? It's 30, so 3,000, right? Um, <laughs> So that's going to be 3,000 kilometers south. So that is the distance and displacement to Mexico. Now, what if I wanted to um, find out, OK, well, uh, I need to know this journey from here to here now. How do I find that out? Same thing. The exact same thing. Right, we're going to use the exact same thought process. So again, our change in our position is going to be equal to our change, sorry, our velocity times our change in our time. And what was our velocity to Texas? 400 kilometers per hour north. And it took two hours to get there. 
This will give us 800 um, kilometers north. Now, does distance care about the path you take? It does. So what will be our total distance traveled? 3,000 plus 800. So that means our total distance traveled will be this 3,000 here to Mexico plus this 800 here to Texas. Which will be 3,800. So our uh, the distance here was our 3,000 plus 800, which gives us 3,800 kilometers. Markers dying here. And then what about my displacement, however? What about my total displacement? Yep. I don't. Yeah, go for it. 3,000 minus the 800? Uh, exactly, right? Because this was our 3,000 kilometers south, and this was 800 kilometers north. So you need to subtract them, right? Because we're looking for the total displacement, which is going to be from here to here. So we are only interested in that, right? We are only interested in that, and that will be 3,000 minus 800. So our total displacement here is going to be our uh, 3,000 kilometers minus our 800 kilometers, giving us 2,200 kilometers. And what do I need to put here? So. Excellent. I need that direction. So. All right, sorry, that problem was a little bit long-winded there. I could have worded that better. Uh, but you get the idea, right? So now that we are working with equations a little bit, um, you do have to be fairly proficient in solving for x. It doesn't really get harder than this, though. The equations at a grade 10 level are just going to be single-step solve for x, effectively. Um, at a grade 11 level, though, we start introducing equations that have four variables. So uh, it becomes more challenging. So your math skills when solving for x do become a little bit more challenging at a grade 11 level. Any questions at all about speed and velocity?